happens when we all heed the same training, aimed at the same thing, seek the same goals, and work together as a church like we're supposed to. Start turning the remote off. experiment a bunch of different times and they found the key was this. They had to have a slightly flexible surface that they set all the metronomes on. If it was a hard surface, it didn't matter what that hard surface was on, they never got synchronized where they were all working together. But as long as they had a slightly flexible surface where there was a little bit of give and there was a little bit of, of adjustment, then eventually those metronomes would all come into the same timing. And like you saw, not just that they would tick at the same time, but that the arm actually swung, <laughs> synchronized with all the other ones. And, and I think that's a really good illustration of what we're seeking to see happen in our church with all of our servants. Whether you work in youth ministry, whether you work in nursery, whether you work somewhere that nobody ever sees what you do, or whether you're up front in front of a Sunday school class or in front of the auditorium every week. We all have the, t the gifts and talents that God's given us, but there are some things from Scripture that are universal for all ministries, all people. Now, there are things that aren't, and we're going to talk about those just a little bit. But if you would, join me in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. If you don't have your Bible with you, I'll read that uh, out loud here in just a second. But if you have your Bible, I would invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 20. And in this passage... We have Jesus speaking to a group of people that are desiring to understand how he says things ought to happen. 
And when he begins to teach them a principle of greatness, he immediately goes to serving. And this is really something that turned the, the atmosphere of the time on its head. Greatness was not seen as when you're great when you serve people. This culture, this society thought you're great when you get to boss a bunch of people around and when you have a bunch of authority and when you get to tell a bunch of people what to do. That was the idea of greatness. Not really that far removed from us today, is it? The more people you boss around, the more people you have under you, the more people you get to tell what to do, that's how you know that you're great, right? But in this passage, in Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 25, it says, Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Now the reason he was using the Gentiles is because at this time he was focusing on his ministry to, to Israel. So he was talking to a group of Jewish people. And he said, you Jewish people, you've watched how the outside world does it. You've watched these empires come in and rule and reign over you. You see Rome ruling and reigning over you. And you watch their behavior and you know that those who have a position, it says they come in and they, they lord it over them. In other words, they come in and they demand that you look up at them. And they demand to tell you what to do. And they demand to be in control. And they, they lord it over you. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet, it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So in this passage, we are taught that leadership is not a bad thing. We're taught that authority is not a bad thing. It's when we exercise it not according to God's economy that it becomes a bad thing. And so as we talk about our leadership pipeline, if you'll fill in the blank, with God's church ought to be a shining light of servant leadership to the world around us. Servant leadership to the world around us. It's not that we don't have leadership. It's not that we don't have people in charge of things. It's not that we don't have people in positions of authority. We're actually commanded to do that in the church according to God's design. The key is that we understand that being in that position, we make sure that we handle it the way that God has designed it, and that is with servant leadership. In other words, the more people you lead, the more people you serve. It's not the more people you lead, the more people you boss around. The more people you lead, that just means you have more people counting on you, and there's more serving you have to do and you need to do. So in thinking about how to develop in our church more and more leaders beginning uh, at foundation and growing up, uh, in the book by Eric Geiger and Kevin Peck, they write about this massive study was done on leadership, and they came to the conclusion that there are five leadership qualities that make up between 60 and 70 percent of leadership in any context. Military, business, church, doesn't matter. Home, anywhere. And that out of those five, con or those five qualities, if a person will capitalize, learn those, work on those, any leadership role they step into anywhere, they'll already have 60 to 70% of the leadership things that they need ready to go in place, learned, and practiced. They list those out as the strategist, executioner, that's not like with a big sword, that's <laughs> making stuff happen, uh, talent manager, human capital developer, and integrity. So the question might be, well, what about the other 30%? We have to acknowledge, right, that individual leadership roles require different skills and abilities. Uh, just because somebody is a good, let's say, office manager doesn't mean that they'll be a good uh, school principal. Just because somebody's a good school principal doesn't mean they can be a business CEO or CFO. Just because somebody can lead well one ministry in the church doesn't necessarily mean they can take all that and just roll right into any other role and do it well. We need to understand there is a difference. And so between maybe the business world, if you would, and in the church, there's a difference between volunteer roles and paid roles. There is a difference there. But now here's a myth that we need to dispel about the difference in this. Since it's church, well, just, you know, 
It doesn't really matter that much. It's just church, so the standards are relaxed. Well, th there's a, an interesting word in that that I made sure and included for you. Anybody want to pick out where the problem might have come from based on just one word in that sentence? Integrity. Uh, okay, well, no, specifically just that myth quote. You're right, wow. integrity is going to come into play. Just. Yeah, when we think of it as being just church, that uncovers that we have an, a perspective that, well, it's less important than other things. Well, it's, it's, it's not going to be quite as important as because it's just church. Can I challenge you with 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31? Anybody know what that verse says? starts with whether. Or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. There really shouldn't be anything in your life that is just the, the mom who's at home with the little babies. Don't ever think you're just being a mom. Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of all times, wrote a book specifically to address the importance of the mom who stays at home with the kids. Now, if Charles Spurgeon, with thousands of people in his church, famous preacher, had a sermon published in the newspaper every Monday morning, if he wanted to stop and draw importance and significance and recognition to, to the role of the mom, how could we ever look at it and go, well, it's just being a mom. No, there, there's no such thing as just being a mom. In fact, there really shouldn't be any part of our life and go, well, it's just this. Because if it's ours to do, God said do it for His glory. The second area that we know it is different is between people versus a product. People versus a product. It's very easy uh, in our culture and in our day and in our economy uh, in the D6 videos we watched at the beginning of this week. Is that the beginning of this week? Time flies. Um, the beginning of this week, uh, one of the speakers laid out the, the development and the history of how America got to Henry Ford's assembly line and pointed out how it was great for certain products, but then we kind of brought it into the church and we said, okay, well, if you'll change the diaper and then you'll teach them the verse and then you'll pick them up and then you'll drop them off. And if when they come in, they walk in the door and you get them this book and you get them this shirt and then they say that verse and then they, and we've assembly line set up the church where we're producing a product rather than remembering that in our context, it's always about people. We're not looking for a product. We're looking at developing people. So the myth is the more people we have, or the more widgets we make, or the more whatevers we sell, we, we've got to remember we're not dealing with a product, but oftentimes we think the more people we have, the more successful we are. Now, is that necessarily untrue? No. No, it doesn't have to be untrue, but by itself, it's not, necess it's not a true statement. We are not measured in success by the number of people, i.e. the number of things we can roll off the assembly line. We're measured by what? Well, Matthew 28, 19, and 20 tells us what our job is. Jesus says, here's, here's what I'm going to hold you responsible for. Here's what I'm going to judge what you do against. He says, here is what I want you to do. I want you to go out and make disciples. So we'll be measured against, did we make healthy believers? Did we make disciples? It's not going to be so much a question of the number as much as did we make sure and focus on the people. It's not about assembling a line where we can process and get to a final number as much as it is about watching out for the people that God entrusts to us and working with them and helping them to grow and become healthy. So, bringing the leadership development into context with our purpose, we have a passage in Acts, actually several different passages, but in Acts chapter 2 we're told about the beginning of the church. And we're told about how Jesus told the apostles to go to Jerusalem and wait on the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit would come, then they would be empowered to go out and do ministry. So they go to Jerusalem, they wait, they're in the upper room. Uh, and it says that on a particular day, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and indwelled them. And it says that the church launched that day in all its fullness. And, and at the end of the passage in Acts chapter 2 where we're told about the launch of the church and Peter's first sermon and many people from all over the world hearing the gospel and trusting Jesus and getting saved, the summary at the end of chapter 2 is this. 
It says, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So we have in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, we're told that there will be people added to the church. And that's good. That's not a bad thing. We're not saying it's a bad thing. But what we need to make sure and understand is that's not the end of the process. We see the church flourish and the church is expanding and the church is, is reaching more and more people. But as we get to Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, we read about a problem that they have. It says, now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, or the, the Jews against the Greeks basically, because their widows were neglected in daily distribution. How many of you have realized that it's totally okay to have growing pains in church? It's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect all the time. There are going to be things we don't even know are problems until we get to them. I believe this is what happens in Acts chapter 6. The church is growing and expanding, and all of a sudden one day somebody looks around and goes, Whoa, we got a problem. Okay, we have a problem. Let's identify the problem. Let's work on it together. And so it says that they were multiplying, and then this growth issue came up. But because there were godly men who had been developed in leadership, who were stepping up, and they had these people developed and ready to go, it says in verse 5 that the congregation put forth these numbers. They identified the men, the apostles laid hands on them, set them out to be, I believe, deacons. It doesn't actually say in their deacons, but I think it makes a lot of good sense. And we're told that when they get those leaders in charge of that problem taking care of the church's needs, look at what happens in verse 7. It says, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, that's awesome that it multiplied greatly, but did anybody notice the problem they still had? Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. Where were the disciples multiplying greatly? In Jerusalem. What did Jesus tell them their, their plan was to be? He said, you shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. And you see, in Acts chapter 6 is where we see this culmination of the, the disciples multiplying in Jerusalem and the persecution that comes against them in Jerusalem until God, through persecution, calls the Jewish people to go and to begin to spread out. So we read about Stephen preaching and the first martyr there in chapter 7, and immediately chapter 8 is Saul's persecution, and right after that is when we start to read about how the disciples and the deacons were going out into other areas, specifically Judea and Samaria, and spreading the gospel and disciples multiplying there. So what we need to understand is that as we grow as a church, we need to have leaders who are ready to take on either challenges that an existing leader has had but for whatever reason needs to step away from, or we have new challenges that come up. Well, as we talked about, 60 to 70% of the leadership and development that you will train in in any ministry, you get to carry over to any new challenge that gets tackled. Now, if in your mind you're thinking, well, I'm not really sure about this leader thing, I'm just a worker, Remember what we said about just? Yeah, there's no such thing as just. A, it's different roles, but, but it's all the same thing. Because you see, as a worker, you are still leading somebody. And one of the things we'll look at is you're at least leading you. But as a quest leader, you go into a room. Is that room empty? Or is it full of little boys and girls that are looking to you to lead them towards Christ and godliness and knowledge and discipleship? You see, no matter who you are, no matter what role you're in, you are leading somebody. And one of the things that I want us to encourage to shift in our mind as we think about leadership development is this idea of the difference between a travel agent and a tour guide. When you want to go on a trip and you call a travel agent, do they go with you? No. No. They go, hey, I bought you a ticket. I'm going to send you on a plane. You're going to go do this, and you're going to go do that, and I've set up an appointment for you over here, an appointment for you over there. Tour guide says, hey, we're going to fly over to here, and we're going to go together to this appointment, and we're going to go see this thing together. And, and what they do is they go with you along the way. And how many times has your tour guide, or should your tour guide have done this thing before they take you? 
at least once, hopefully, right? They're like, well, I don't know. I've never been here. What do you want to do? Uh, and the, the whole point of having a tour guide is somebody's been there and done that, and then they go back to something they know, and they take you along and let you experience it as well. And this is the crux of discipleship, where we take somebody who's ready for ministry and we say, hey, I've been doing this ministry. Let me show you how to do this ministry. Let me pass this on to you. So we want to make sure and think about ourselves as travel agents versus tour guides. One of the things that Pastor Jim and, and uh, Rich and Chuck and the other guys that we're committed to is that we don't want to go around looking at our church and go, okay, w what need do we have? Oh, we have this need. Well, what poor victim, I mean volunteer, <laughs> can we throw into that role? Now, when we went through the number of volunteers that we have in our church, one of the things that we counted the first time around was just what's the bare minimum to do the work to get by. But then we went back and said, but what we really should have are teachers that are being trained, assistants that are being trained, directors that are being trained in all ministries, in almost all areas, people that are coming along and learning the ministries, learning how to do the things that other people might already be doing. And you might look at that and go, well, that's kind of silly if we got somebody doing it. Why are we training somebody else? Because none of us know when we're going to be here. It, it could be, God forbid, through, through death that one of our faithful workers passes off. It could be like Bill Royce walked up to me one Sunday and said, hey, my promotion just went through. They're moving me Tuesday. I'm going to Vegas. Literally, within two days of when he talked to me, he was in Vegas living and starting his job out there. But none of us know for sure how those things are going to happen in our lives. And it's not about us knowing the future. It's just knowing about how we're supposed to lead and guide others to ministry. And it may be that you train somebody up for ministry and you get them all trained and then they go, I'm going to go over here. That's really annoying as a pastor, can I tell you? <laughs> Some of the best workers that I have ever seen grow and develop to become uh, leaders and, and stepping up to leadership in their role come and go, hey, pastor, I'm moving. <laughs> But you know what? It makes me get okay and realize it's about the kingdom. It's not about my kingdom. And, and so we, we get to wrestle with those things. But let us be tour guides. Take people along with us as we are doing ministry so that they can learn how to do ministry. And then at the bottom of page two there, some shifts in thinking. If we are going to grow vines or people instead of just building trellises or having fancy structures and programs. And a list of things I would encourage you to read through there uh, as you have time. So at the bottom of page three, there is this series of blanks. And the question is, what is the pipeline? Well, the pipeline is how we want to seek to develop people from a, a starting place and help them grow sequentially through responsibilities, uh, roles, uh, learning process, skill sets, until they become what God wants them to be. Now, let's go through this progression, and then I want to make sure and, and mention something. So we start at what? what? What is our, according to our structure, what is the starting place for anybody in ministry? W which one of these? A worker. a worker, good. So we start at worker, and then a worker who has been faithful, who has demonstrated that they will do their job, that, that seeks to grow in the things that they need to grow in, and they believe God's called them into something else, or something more, or a greater role of influence, then they move from worker to director. director. Good. And so then those who are working faithfully at, at being a director and developing those skills and those responsibilities and doing what God's called them to do there, they feel like God's called them to seek out more than we move them from director to leader. Now probably the main role or main difference between a director and a leader is a leader will be over multiple ministries, where a director would be over one ministry. And then as the leader is being faithful to what God's called them to do, if they believe God's called them to more influence and more responsibility in ministry, then we would seek to develop them into the role of pastor. pastor. Okay, now, I want to make sure and mention, this is not the chart to get to the top of. God's not called everybody in this room to be a director. If he did, we wouldn't have any workers. Right? I mean, it just makes sense. Not everybody in this room is called to be a leader. If all of us were leaders, there would be no directors or workers. Not all of us are called to be pastors. So just because it's there doesn't mean that you're only successful or important or spiritual if you go to the next one. In fact, in the business world, there is a, a term coined 
about people who do a fantastic job at their role and then are promoted into catastrophe. It's, it's called the Peter Principle. Uh, I don't know if it's because Peter Drucker came up with it or Peter in the Bible. I don't know. It's just the Peter Principle. The idea is, man, this guy can sell like nobody else. We need to make him a salesman director. And you put him in a salesman director role and he flops horribly and everything goes bad. Why? Because he's a good salesman, not a good sales director. So we're moving back into the salesman role. So just because you are really good at what you're doing does not mean that God wants you to do something else. No, he might, but not necessarily. And so as you are in these roles, don't feel like what we're saying is if you are a worker, well, you know, you'll really be a little more important if you'll become a director. No. No, we don't want you to be a director unless God is burdening you and calling you to be a director. I, I would, I think it was Pastor Jim and I talking the other day, uh, the best advice I give, can give to a young person who's thinking about ministry is, if you can do anything else, don't. Don't be a pastor unless you know that nothing else in life God will let you do. Why? Because not everybody's supposed to be a pastor. Uh, it's not an easy thing. Only do that if that's what God's calling you to do. And by the same token, if God's called you to be the president of the United States, don't be a pastor. If God's called you to be a pastor, don't be president of the United States. Do what God's called you to do. So please don't mistake this diagram that is intended to show what the progression is to mean that everybody is supposed to go through that progression. All right, let's take about a two-minute break. Anybody needs to clean up the table or get some coffee or something to drink, maybe another cookie, and we'll jump in to work. Walk up. Walk up. You come call me. You need to talk.
of a worker. <laughs> what step of leadership is this? They are leading self. Leading self. That may sound a little bit weird, but uh, I bet all of you, if you were honest, you've had those mornings where you wake up and you're laying in bed and you're trying to talk yourself into getting out of bed and doing what you're supposed to do. Amen. Yeah, yeah you, you're leading self. You, we lead ourselves. So, examples, and there's a whole list there, just all kinds of different ministries in the church. Now, a couple of bridges from non-involvement to serving on a ministry team, some things we have in place to help move people into a role of serving. Some required training before starting as a worker. Uh, that is this training here, as soon as it is offered again, so I guess technically that's not before, although if we can get it before, that's the best. The three-week check-it-out period, that is for us to see if that person is going to be faithful to show up, and also let them just come in and see if it's what they think it is. Then the ministry-specific orientation training, some different ministries have this. That's up to the individual ministry that they may be joining. And then possible membership at GBC, again, depending on what role that is. Suggested training before starting as a worker. Uh, our design class, it goes through, uh, what is design? Six different ways that God has made us unique, seeking to discover how we have uniqueness that makes us specifically wired or better at a certain ministry role than another role or than another person. Uh, it is not a magic pill that tells you exactly where you will be super duper happy serving, but it is a way to get you started understanding that and having some good leads. And then lastly, I can't recommend this book enough, Good News for Bad People by Roy Hessian. It really helped me as a young leader in church to realize that when people don't do everything I think they should, it's not because they hate Jesus. <laughs> I thought that. I really did. I was like, if you don't do things right, it's because you hate Jesus. What other reason could there be? Uh, and, and this guy really goes through the scripture and he maps out how completely under the curse and control and blindness of sin that we are in our flesh and how that carries through into so many areas of life. And it, and it really will help you have a passion and a compassion to get people the truth of the Word of God to help them with their problems. All right, so on page five, this begins to go into one of those five things that we talked about. We have slightly different names because we are in a, a church context. But the first area we want to talk about is worker discipleship. Discipleship. So what's the summary here? The summary for discipleship at the worker level is that they know the gospel and take personal responsibility for self-development. They know the gospel and take personal responsibility for self-development. Now, a lot of this is the same information we've gone over before. The information didn't change. But I still want to walk through it slow, or, or a couple of things. Then we're going to do a little workshop with this. So stay tuned in here. So number one in your, your booklet, the gospel defined. Somebody came up to you and said, so what exactly is this gospel of Jesus thing? 
well, and then 10 minutes later, you're still rambling because you just keep throwing in all the stuff you know about salvation and about Jesus. A lot of times that's what ends up happening, right? We're like, well, you know, it's about how God loves us and he created us. And so then we, because we know creation from the seven days and you go into a answers in Genesis seven step proof of, and then you, I mean, if we don't know what God says the gospel is, if we don't have that from Scripture, we might just kind of fumble all over ourselves. But it's really freeing to know that God says the gospel message is this. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's writing to the church and says, look, what I received, I delivered to you first of all. And that's this. He says that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's it. That's the gospel. Now, your story of how you came to know the gospel is much bigger than that. The stuff that goes in around that is much bigger than that. Helping them to understand it is probably much bigger than that. But the core of the gospel, or the gospel at its core, is those three simple things. Number two, gospel sharing. If you are going to serve Christ, it probably is kind of important that we are able to communicate the most basic message that Jesus gave us, right? I mean, if I work for a company and they come in and they go, hey, here's three words that every customer needs to know. Here's three words that every worker needs to know. Here's three things that everything in our world revolves around. I probably better know those three things. And in the same way, Jesus left us here after we got saved to do something. That is to minister to people. And so if we're going to minister to people, we probably better be able to explain to them the very basic message that starts all of this stuff in having a relationship with Jesus. So we need to be able to share the gospel. We need to explain it clearly. We need to be able to give it in some way that makes sense to us so that we can help it make sense to them. Not that we're talking them into salvation, but we as God's people need to be able to communicate God's message. Number three, gospel counseling. Now this is a little bit different than just simple gospel sharing because somebody may come and say, hey, I'm not sure I'm saved. Well, the Bible tells us how to know for sure that you're saved. And you walk them through a way to know that they're saved, and they look at you and they go, I did that. Now what? Where do you go from there? If they did that, well, then why are they asking questions about being saved? Well, what's going on in their life that they need help with if they're, they've done what the Bible says about being saved, but they're not sure they're saved? How come they didn't know that that's what the Bible says is being saved? There's all kinds of other things that now come into play that you can have a conversation with and help them with if you're able to have that setting with them. Number four, gospel-centered serving. What does this mean? This does not mean that everything that you do means sharing the gospel every time you walk into a room with people. That's not what we mean by gospel-centered serving. What we mean is understanding that because of the gospel, you have freedom in Christ that you want to share with other people. What we mean is that you understand that it is only the gospel of Jesus Christ that sets people free from their sin. And so you understand that's the basic need that every person out there has. No matter how poor they are, no matter what their circumstance is, you understand their core need is Jesus and salvation. And because of the freedom that you have in Christ to serve, you're going to serve so that they can hear the gospel, so that they can get saved, and you're going to help them understand to live and walk in the gospel after salvation. Gospel is not just for the moment of salvation, then you're done with it. The gospel informs us as to how it is that we live our daily life after that moment in time when we trust Jesus and repent of our sin. And then number five, gospel-centered living. That's how we don't just serve because we know the gospel. We live we are empowered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ to live free to serve God and not in bondage to sin. They have these things called cruises to nowhere. You get on a boat, you go on a cruise because you just want the experience of the cruise. You're not actually going anywhere. You just like riding on a boat and eating all the time. So you go get on a boat, you ride on a boat, you eat all the time, and when the cruise is over, guess where you end up? Right back where you started. May we not be guilty of having programs to nowhere where people come in, they don't know the gospel, they're not following Christ. They come in, they go through all of our programs, they go through all of our experience, and then they leave the exact same way that they started, still not knowing Jesus and still not being saved. 
And let's make sure that we do better than that with what God's given us to do. So then we look at the discipleship competencies. In other words, the things that we want you to be able to do, comfortable with, uh, things that you have controlled and, and, and mastered in order to be able to serve the way God's called you to serve. Number one, become fluent at presenting the gospel, including personal testimony and scriptures. That doesn't mean every time it's going to include your personal testimony. What we mean there is that's a very good way for you to learn how to present the gospel is by giving your personal testimony. Uh, well, it can be a good way for you to present the gospel. Just because you give your story doesn't mean you've presented the gospel. So we want to make sure and include those together. Uh, and then the scriptures. We want to make sure that you know how to lay out the scriptures that go with salvation. Number two, to be able to counsel for a salvation decision. In other words, somebody comes to you and says, hey, Mr. Chuck, Mr. Chuck, I want to go to heaven. Mr. Chuck goes, well, all right, go see Nate. <laughs> No, we want Mr. Chuck and every other servant at our church to be able to be comfortable, maybe not at counseling for every issue in life, but at least able to go, I can tell you about how to be saved. Let's sit down and look at some scriptures. And then number three, demonstrating personal growth steps in our healthy growth strategy. It is our goal, we believe, that you will be most fulfilled, most healthy, as God's child, when you are engaged in all five of the steps of a healthy growth strategy. And that's not just our idea. That's straight from the things that we see in Scripture. So let's do a little gospel counseling workshop. In connecting eternally lost people to a holy God, upon which depends their eternity and the joy of their ever, earthly life, we ought to take great care that we follow God's path, plan, pattern, rather than our own logic or common sense. What, what am I saying there? The point is, don't sit down with somebody who's asking questions about going to heaven and start just kind of rambling about how you think it works. Don't just sit down and go, well, you know, here at Gospel, we believe that... Uh, and it doesn't matter what Gospel believes. I mean, it does, but not in, in that context. We need to be able to take them and show them what does the Scripture say, and that includes using the terminology that the Scripture uses making only the promises that Scripture promises and not promising the things that Scripture doesn't promise. So, number one, open the Bible. <laughs> You're going, really? Yes. Make sure and open the Scriptures. Why? Because they need to know that what you're telling them is what God said, not just your opinion. Number two, show them the verses you're reading or let them read the verses. Why? So that they know that what you're telling them is what God said. By the way, what does God say the power is going to come from for a person to get saved? Is it your persuasive speech? No. Romans chapter 10 says, How they believe in him and whom they have not heard. It's when they hear the truth of Scripture that God changes their heart and mind, not when you and I are convincing. Number three, use God's terminology. And if you come across a word like repentance and they go cross-eyed, it's okay. <laughs> Just explain what repentance means. If you see a verse and, and it says propitiation, that's okay. Just stop and explain to them what propitiation means. If you don't know, ask somebody else or get a dictionary. It's okay. Number four, remember the Holy Spirit is doing the work. Uh, probably the best illustration I can give to you in this is in our own home. When our kids would come to us and say, hey, I'm one of God's children, or hey, I'm in God's family, or hey, I want to whatever, it's really difficult as a parent to not jump on that and go, awesome, let's pray for it, right? But we know that the scripture says the Holy Spirit is calling them. And unless the Holy Spirit calls them, they can't be saved. And so we want to work to help them identify, is the Holy Spirit calling you, or are you just doing what you know the teacher said at church you're supposed to do? Because there's a difference in those. And so with each one of our kids, we were very hesitant to just jump right into, let's pray, pray together. With every one of them, we would ask them questions. And usually, the first couple of conversations ended with, well, why don't you think about that and pray about that and come back and let me know what you think God's telling us? Why? Because we want to make sure it's a Holy Spirit work thing. Uh, Callan was probably the one that took the longest, uh, partially because he's probably the smartest, 
uh, at that age. And, and he just, at that age, <laughs> he just intellectually connects things so much faster uh, than, than, well, I do, but um, than, than normal. And so he, I wanted to make sure, okay, this is not just an intellectual thing he's doing because he knows it's, you know, going to keep him out of hell. And so we processed, and it, and it was about eight or nine months of time before we got to the point where when I would ask him questions, it, it would finally be at a place where he was, yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's what I need to do. Uh, and so if I'm going to do that with my own kids, I'm not counseling you, you know, to be hesitant because we want to keep people out of heaven or something. Uh, this is something I've done with my own children. We need to, as we're counseling, no matter how excited you are about maybe getting to lead somebody to the Lord, make sure that the Holy Spirit is doing the work in that process. All right, so things to avoid. Ask Jesus into your heart. Why would we not want to counsel somebody to ask Jesus into their heart? Might freak them out, but okay, might freak them out, especially kids. Yeah, because kids are concrete thinkers, and they're going. <laughs> okay, good. Why else would we not want to counsel somebody with that particular terminology? Because Scripture says your heart's deceitful. Okay, because one, one place that tells us that our heart is deceitful, and so we don't want to invite Jesus to come and be a part of our deceitful thing. Okay, good. Where in Scripture does it tell us to invite Jesus into our heart? It doesn't. So that's the main reason we're not going to invite people to invite Jesus into their heart, because when they go later to find out what they did, and they look up that phrase in the Bible, and they can't find it, they can't find in the Bible what you had them do. So, not only because it's confusing, because our heart is deceitful, but because they can't follow up. They can never go again and see what the Scripture says about inviting Jesus into their heart. Okay, so we would uh, avoid that. Some other things to avoid, and this just goes along the lines of practically what we were looking at. Uh, you've probably all been a part of an environment where a leader has a group of kids, and all right, boys and girls, bow your head and close your eyes. All right, now who wants to go to heaven? Of course everybody wants to go to heaven. <laughs> Who's going to raise their hand and go, no, nope, not me. <laughs> but is that a good basis for a decision for salvation? No, no that, that, that really sets it up to, you know, it's kind of like asking who wants a lollipop. Well, you know, everybody's hand is going up. Um, one of the things you want to be careful of is all you have to do is pray a prayer. Or all you have to do is ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Or all you have to do is whatever. Why would we want to avoid that? Because it's a journey. Okay, it makes it sound simple. What is it? Because it's a journey, not okay. just yeah. a Yeah, yeah, because we know what we mean. We mean for that moment of salvation, it's not you don't earn it, you don't work for it, you don't buy it. It's it's not that God will do it. But what they probably hear is well, if I just pray this prayer, then from that point on, I'm good to go. I don't need to worry about this whole church thing or serving Jesus. All I had to do was, and then I'm good. So the other part of that is, if you look at the life of Jesus, he never stood in front of a group and went, hey, all you have to do is just... Matter of fact, every time he talked to people, he went, all right, I'm going to turn it up a little bit here. If you don't follow me, you have to hate father and mother and brother and sister and, and you have to forsake all, and you have to take up your electric chair daily and follow me, and you have to. I mean, he turned it up the notch. Why would we then go the other direction when, when we're doing that? So we want to avoid that. Or, as we talked about earlier, using just. Well, just, just ask Jesus to love you. And, you know, let, let's avoid those things. So what do we need to be sure to include? Well, based on Paul's passage in Romans, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, we know what the gospel is. We need to include a couple of things. First of all, show them the verses. We talked about that already, right? Be sure to include this issue of sin. You know, if you ask most Christians to define the gospel and you said it, that Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and rose again the third day, they'd go, yes. What major element that I completely just leave out? Sin. Kind of a big part of the problem, right? So we need to make sure that we include the issue of sin separating us from God. That Jesus died on the cross for our sins. 
Jesus was buried and third, rose again the third day. And we'll come back to that follow-up follow up one here in just a second. I want to show you a very practical way that's easy, and I'll tell you when we get to the end why I like it so much. Um, and, and this is the bridge illustration. Anybody familiar with the bridge illustration? Okay, I, I think this is one of the easiest ways because if you've got a napkin and a pen, you can do it. If you've got a whiteboard, if you, it doesn't matter. Anywhere you can write on something, I mean, you can even write on the inside of your hand if you had to. This is a really good way to help people kind of wrap these concepts up together. And so what we do is we draw two sides. Now, if you want to start with it just being here and God and us, that's okay. But if you start with it connected, then you erase it because of the fall in Genesis, and then you draw this big gap here. So obviously, the first thing that's going to register for them is, hey, I'm, I'm not over there with God. There, there's a problem here. Something's going on. And so we get to deal with the issue of sin. And sin separates us from God. And there's a couple of passages that we can go to and use that. I would encourage you to use Romans 3, 23. I'm going to give you these verses, and these are at the bottom of your page. I believe. Yeah, the bottom of your page. This is called the Romans Road. Uh, it's that because you start toward the beginning of Romans, and you just walk through Romans, and you hit verses as you go. And these verses sequentially tell them the plan of salvation. So you deal with the issue of sin. And you can draw about how we all try happiness, and we try money, and we try family, and we try religion. And you can draw and show them how we try all kinds of things to get to God, but they all fall short of the glory of God in the verse. So then when they recognize that problem is there, then you go to Romans 6. 23, which talks about the consequences of this, and that is eternal separation from God, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we draw this cross here. You can write Jesus to help them understand. That's about how Jesus gave his life on the cross to bridge the gap between us and God that we couldn't bridge otherwise. It was through Jesus' sacrifice that our sin problem is taken care of. And then finally, Romans 10, 9 and 10, which is the point where it calls us to recognize this, to make that decision, to confess this to God. Now, the reason I like this bridge illustration so much is because if you get done talking to somebody and you've told them all this information, how do you know where they're at? Well, you could just ask them, but they might really not know how to express very well where they're at. But with this illustration, you can erase this little guy and say, hey, where are you on this? Are you back here where you don't even really think about God? Are you here still trying your own works to earn your way to God? Or are you here? Where now that you know how to be right with God, you're ready to confess your sin and receive Christ. So it's a really good way for them to put their input. You know, a lot of times I've had people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm right here. I've never had anybody put themselves all the way over here. I, I'm right here. Or a lot of times they'll say, well, I'm, I'm right here. So then what do you do? What's stopping you? What's keeping you from crossing that bridge? What's stopping you from making the decision that Romans 10 calls for? And, and a lot of times, it's a really simple way for them to process the information, realize that they're ready. You give them a chance to think about, well, why wouldn't I do this? And then a lot of times, that's a really easy way to lead into that time where you invite them to make that decision and <coughs> trust Christ as Savior. So, we're going to take five minutes and here's what I want you to do. I want you to break up with one other person. At your break up with one other person at your table, and uh, and go go. Uh, you can spread out. You can stand at the table. Whatever you want to do, pull your chair off somewhere else, and just practice talking through the gospel. Now, please take your book with you. Open your Bible up with you. Take it a step at a time. Don't don't rush through it and then get to the end and go, oh, that was terrible. 
and stop. No, think through it and go, okay, I need to start with and, and walk through that. So take about five minutes. Go do that with somebody. Each of you practice it, okay? And then when you get done, go, all right, did I do all these? Did I avoid all these? It's going to take practice. You're not going to be perfect the first time you do it, okay? But the more you do it with somebody that you're very comfortable with, then the more you'll be ready to do it when you're with somebody and you may not be quite as comfortable. So go ahead and take five minutes, run through that, and we'll come back together. Yeah, you, you've got to go with somebody besides each other. Oh. Oh. All right, I'm going to yeah. lead the call of cheers. <laughs> Yes. 
seconds. He's not talking fast. He's just thought through it enough, practiced it enough. He knows the basics and he can lay it out. So I just wanted to show it to you as an example and encourage him to you that it doesn't have to be super duper overwhelming. So at some point in your journey with Jesus, someone's likely to ask you, what is the hope that you have? Who is this Jesus that you talk about? Why do you participate in this thing called church? And at that moment, you'll have the opportunity to proclaim the gospel to that person. And so it's important for us as believers to know and love and understand the gospel so that when asked that question, we can fluently and freely share the gospel with that person. So when you are asked that question, you can answer with something like this. God is the creator of the earth and everything in it. He is perfectly holy, just, and righteous. He created man and woman in his image, and he created us to live in perfect harmony with each other and with him. And then our original parents, Adam and Eve, rebelled against God and ushered sin into the world. And as descendants of Adam and Eve, we have all participated in this sin. And because of our sin, God can rightly deal with us by giving us his wrath and ultimately separating us from him forever. But he didn't leave us to our own devices. Instead, the Son of God entered into the world and took on flesh. He became Jesus Christ, and he lived the perfect life that we could not live in our place. And then he died the death that we deserved. He lay dead in that tomb for three days. And, and on that third day, he was resurrected by the power of the Spirit, proving his sacrifice acceptable in the eyes of the Father. And our response to this good news about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is repentance and faith. Repentance is turning from our sin, and faith is placing our hope in Jesus as our Savior. You can respond in this way. This is the gospel. Pretty short, right? Now, he didn't take a whole lot of breaths in there, but <laughs> add in your breaths, and it'll take, you know, 95 seconds. Yeah. But, but still, a way for us to realize it can be fairly concise. <coughs> now, one thing I would encourage you to do is if you're in casual conversation, that's okay. But if somebody's getting serious about it, to, to open up the scriptures, even if it's on your, your phone, um, and, and let them read those texts for themselves. Now, the last thing we didn't talk about is the follow-up 
and then there's a star there by parents. Follow-up. Think about your follow-up if you are counseling somebody about the gospel or about a salvation decision. One of the things that I was taught to do and that I try to always do when somebody has gone through a process of getting saved, when I have the ability to, to counsel with them, is when we get finished, I ask them two things. First, so if you go out and kill somebody, are you still going to go to heaven? Yes. They always say no. <laughs> they do. They always go. And it's an opportunity to follow up with them on Romans 10, 13, and talk to them about how they are in a permanent relationship with God. It's obviously not in the context that you can go out and do whatever you want to now, and, and we explain that. But the, the point is to help them begin to wrestle and overcome this issue of, do I lose it because I'm not good enough? Do I lose it because I do a bad thing? That kind of thing. The other question that I ask them is, do you know somebody that you think would be excited to hear this news? <coughs> And I encourage them to go out and share that with somebody right away. If it's here at church, I may encourage them and, and to go to a leader in their ministry or to go to Pastor Jim or to go talk with Miss Rebecca or somebody that I know that when they hear this person, however much they fumble and stumble, but when this person expresses that they got saved, somebody that's going to exaggerate and be excited for them. Now, why do we do that? Because we're setting them up for that pattern that God has given them that once they've received the gospel, for them to go out and share it with others. And what better foundation than to see somebody excited for them about that thing? Now, if you're in a ministry where you might be dealing with young children or a minor, I would encourage you, whatever conversation you have with that person here at church, to be thoughtful about what is the follow-up that needs to happen with the parents. Now, one of the things we don't want to do is pretend that it's us, the professionals here at church, that are the only ones that can lead children to Jesus, we do it and then just tell the parents about it later. I'm not saying you can't pray with them to get saved. What I'm saying is if you know the family and you're confident that those parents can have gospel conversation at home, to finish your conversation with the child and say, hey, let's talk to mom and dad when they come to pick, up, pick you up tonight. And then get kind of off in the corner with mom and dad and the child and say, hey, Johnny was asking me about salvation. So we talked through the gospel, but I told him I thought you guys would really want to have some, some time with him on that question. Now, some of you may be going, oh my goodness, but what if they don't pray and get saved later because you skipped that opportunity? Let's go back to who's doing the work. Is it me or the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Holy Spirit. If I've shared the gospel with them and they truly believe that what I've shared with them, if they truly believe that in their heart, they're probably saved already. It's not the prayer that gets them saved. So, I understand that thought, and I appreciate it, but let, let's don't leave out that there's a, a greater work going on than just me and my words. Now, if you don't know anything about the family, you're not confident in anything at home, you don't know what's going on at home, go ahead and have that conversation, go ahead and lead that child in a decision for Christ, and then when mom and dad come, what a great opportunity to say, hey mom and dad, can I share with you what Sally and I talked about tonight? I walked her through the Bible says about salvation. And now you get to lay out the gospel for the parents and encourage the parents to talk with their child about the decision or to themselves make that decision. So be thinking about follow-up toward those in, to tie especially with minors, to tie the parents into that decision or to inform the parents about the decision that the child may have had. All right, any questions on that? Yes, yes ma'am. What's your follow-up when the parents are non-believers and they object to you having had the Why would you ask that question in here? <laughs> <laughs> couple of things. While that is a possibility, chances are if they've let the child come to church, they're probably going to be at worst ambivalent about it. They don't really care that you led the kid to pray anything. They're not really worried about it one way or the other. You did that, okay, fine, sure, whatever. Now, if you do have a parent that's upset about it, point them to Pastor Jim. Uh, say, you just need to go talk to him. <laughs> you told me to. No, seriously. If you need to say, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure what your questions are, but I know Pastor Jim or Pastor Stephen would certainly like to sit down and, and talk with you and, and hear your concerns about this. Seriously, pass it off on us if you have a parent that's upset about that. Now, the one thing we will say is that we don't do baptism without a parental consent form. Uh, 
they can be ugly when people find out you've been holding their kids underwater without their mom. Um, so, uh, so seriously, if, if you get a parent that is upset, pass them on to, to Pastor Jim myself. So that's a great question. All right, on page one, <laughs> there is a vision workshop at your table. Take three, take four minutes and see if you can fill in. Gospel exists to, don't say it out loud, if you fill that in your table. Then see if as a table you can cooperate, draw, and label GBC's healthy growth strategy. And then at the bottom, see if you can come up with the three core values of the church and the scriptures from which they come. All right? Four minutes, ready, set, go. Spelling and artistry. Thank you. 
All right. I looked at my watch that time. Four minutes. All right, so somebody tell us. Gospel exists to? disciples. Nice. All right. How many of you were able to draw and label the healthy growth strategy? All right, what's step number one? Worship. Two? Learn. Three? Connect. Four? Serve. Six? Repeat. No, uh, that's five. Five. Not six on there. Okay, good. Excellent. You got those. You got them in order. Anybody have to go look it up somewhere? Or? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Good honesty. Now, four values. I learned something. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Four values. Anybody come up with one? They're, they're really not going to be very surprising to you when you hear them. You're going to be like, oh, I just didn't know that's what we call them. Did I hear a, a, I saw a finger pointing back here somewhere. Somebody come back. What'd you come up with? Go. Uh, it's in there. It's not, it's not really one of them. Ah, okay. Go. Get in there. Make disciples. Okay. That's good guessing. That's a good get. You're you're in the ballpark. <laughs> All right. Number one. How do we know what we're going to do? Scripture. The authority of scripture. If you'll just ask yourself, okay, what are the three things that are so essential they guide us in everything we do? What's well, got to start with? What's the boss? Who's the boss? If I'm the boss, then my opinion always wins. If the person with the most flowery language is always the one that convinces us to do what they want, well, then they win. But if there is an objective, divinely inspired standard that we always go to, then it wins. So, the authority of Scripture. Uh, a text that we would take that from. We've got one that we do call on, but anybody want to? What? All Scripture is given. Yes, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Good. All right, there's others we could use. That's just the one we attach to it. Secondly. Pastor. Yes, what please. Was, what was the scripture? Oh, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Or is it 2, 15? I think it's... I always get those confused. My Awana is failing. That's why you're asking that. Awana. Yes, 3, 16, and 17. It's 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, 16, and 17. 2 Timothy 2, 15 is the theme verse. Okay. 2 Timothy 3, 16, and 17. All right. Second core value. If Jesus were to have said, the greatest commandment is this, that'd probably be one that we ought to go by, right? Okay. And what was it? Love God and love others. Right. And the text that that comes out of is? The Bible. <laughs> there might be a version in Mark. It's probably in several of the Gospels. The one we point to is in Matthew chapter 22. That's 37 through 40. It gives the whole story of the guy asking the question and Jesus answering, including the uh, love of others. 37 through 40. And then the last one is, if our purpose statement is going to say something like, glorify God by making disciples, what does that mean? Well, we need to know the definition of a disciple. So the third core value is the definition of a disciple out of, what verse? Matthew 4.19, good. Where Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So those three things, as we are on the journey of making disciples, those three things are so important, they constantly guide everything we do, every decision we make. Not that there aren't other important things. Um, I have often thought that the Great Commission isn't exactly in the core values, but it's in the purpose statement, so we get away with it. All right, let's finish up vision, and we'll probably stop there today. All right, so in vision, what we're looking at is... Oh, to support the vision of the ministry area. A worker is to support the vision of the ministry area. 
So as we just sort of demonstrated, number one, vision origins. Where do we get the vision for ministries for the church from? Is it just our creativity? We, do we just make it up? No, it ought to be out of the scriptures. Our church's purpose statement comes out of Matthew 28, 19 and 20. And while we could point to 1 Corinthians 10 and some other verses, Isaiah 43, 7 is the one that says, We know that God created us to glorify Him. And then the big long blank there, if you want to write it in again, you can. If not, you already wrote it down in your workshop page, so that's fine. Uh, those quotes in that long line are for you to write out the purpose statement. The gospel exists to glorify God by making disciples. So out of that purpose statement comes our vision. Out of knowing that truth, it helps us to visualize where are we going, what are we aiming at, where are we trying to get to. So vision origins comes from the scripture. Number two, vision support. How do you support the vision of a specific ministry area? So we've given you three things there. Letter A, recognize you are helping make the vision happen. It's not a worker's job to come up with the vision. It's a worker's job to come in and go, okay, what is this ministry? What's the vision? What are we trying to accomplish? Where are we going? What are we doing? Here we go. And you become a part of the support of making that happen. Let it be, your ministry is targeted. The reason we bring this up is because a lot of times we feel like, I come into church and I know that people need to hear the gospel and, and saved people need to be challenged toward missions and we need to be financially faithful and we need to know how to witness to our friends and we need to be memorizing the Bible and we need to know about Jesus' life and we need to know who the apostles were and we need to have the Ten Commandments memorized. And so we, gotta, we try to do it all, all the time. That's kind of like hunting air with a shotgun. I mean, you know, you just point it wherever you want and pull the trigger and surely you'll hit something. No, that's not very good at targeting. Our ministries are targeted. And understanding what the target of our ministry is will help us to go, okay, I don't have to do all of those things. I get to do this thing with this group of people in this time frame. And then letter C, to follow the leader. We can look at Hebrews 13, 17, if we needed a text on that. That tells us, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. As those who must give an account, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Um, I, I don't know if Pastor Jim's had this experience or not, but I know I am much more enthused about the pastoral ministry when the people that I am pastorally ministering <laughs> over um, are helping me to enjoy pastorally ministering over them. When it's not the bickering and the backbiting and the fighting and the complaining and the murmuring, it makes it a whole lot easier to get excited about coming and meeting people's needs. On the other hand, it can be an extreme drain to try to meet the needs of people who make it difficult. And it's not just an issue of it's easier or it's better for me. That's an issue of that directly affects back on the, the sheep, the people in the congregation. So follow your leader. I believe, just personal opinion, I don't have any studies to point to other than just my own experience and conversations with people. I believe the reason we can't get more leaders in church is because they know what's going to happen from the followers when they step into a leadership role. I've talked to a lot of people in a church environment that say, I will do anything you ask me to do. I'll be there anytime you want me to be there. I'll fill any role you want me to be. I just won't be in charge of it. And it's not because they're not smart people. I believe it's because they have seen what happens from the people who are following to the people who are leading and they don't want to be the victim of it. Now, I might be wrong. It's happened one other time. All right, number one on page three. Some things we want to challenge you to do. Sounds like you might already have these down. To memorize the church purpose statement and the scripture that goes with it. Number two, to demonstrate appearance and advancement of the ministry-specific vision. In other words, you come in and go, hey, uh, I'm going to work in the kitchen ministry. And boy, I've been doing all of this stuff that's different than what I was asked to do. 
well, well, that didn't really help the ministry vision. Hey, I came into Quest and I started fixing them every week. I've been doing what we should be doing instead of what I was asked to do. No, 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 that's not a help. No, we, we need to come in and we need to advance it. And so demonstrate that you're ready to help move forward the vision <coughs> of the ministry. Now, here's the thing. Could God give you a vision for a ministry that's different than the vision of the ministry you currently serve in? Yes. yes. You know what that means? <coughs> it doesn't mean everybody else is dumb. <laughs> it means you're probably supposed to start a new ministry. I know that's surprising. A lot of times we act like if everybody else isn't like me, then somebody's got to be wrong. Go read Paul and Barnabas when they split over John Mark. Now, one of them could have been wrong, Barnabas. Uh, one of them <laughs> might have been right. I don't know. But what we know is God used it to make two teams of missionaries that went out instead of just one. If God's given you a passion to do something in ministry that's different than what's already going on, that doesn't mean that they're broken, you need to fix them. It probably means that you got a new ministry God's laying on your heart. So just realize that that's probably what's going on. And then in quotes there in the middle of the page, too many chiefs, not enough, not enough Indians. Indians. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> too many chiefs, not enough Indians. What does that mean? Yeah. Too many people wanting to call the shots. Not enough people making stuff happen. Can I challenge you that God will never be able to use you as an effective leader until you are an effective follower? God will never be able to use you as an effective leader until you are an effective follower. I spent a year and a half miserable and hating life at my first ministry because my boss was an idiot. <laughs> Actually, I just thought he was an idiot and thought I knew better than him about everything and was angry because he did stuff wrong all the time. Now, could he have done something wrong during that time? Probably. But the issue wasn't that he was wrong. The issue was I had a pride issue. I thought I was right all the time. And when he didn't do it my way, I got angry and bitter and upset about it. God didn't let me leave. I wanted to leave. I wanted to get away from there. God didn't let me leave. Because it wasn't about him being a perfect leader. It was about, about me learning to be an effective follower. Because God can't use you as an effective leader until you become an effective follower. Letter A, learn the vision of the ministry. Letter B, don't try to change the leader's mind. If you think there's something off in the vision of the ministry, pray for the leader. Letter C, do not try to change the ministry to another vision. If you think there's another vision that needs to have a ministry behind it, come see the pastors about starting it. And then letter D, con contribute ideas and efforts that accomplish the leader's vision. Don't constantly come with visions that or ideas and, and excitement and ideas that have nothing to do with what the vision the ministry is doing. Contribute to what's in place. Learn how to be a contributor to the ministry you're in, and then God will help you be creative and learn how to branch out and do that in your own ministry with a different vision later. All right, we're going to stop there. Next time we will go through the remainder. Some of it is a workshop. Some of it is reviewing the information so that we know for sure that you have it. Please make sure and read through your minor training book, the volunteer handbook for all ministry to with minors. We want to spend time reading through it next time. Pastor Jim's going to go over a few points within it, and then we'll move on. But we are going to ask you to sign a piece of paper that says you have read it, had your questions answered, you understand it. If you don't have that confidence to sign it, see Pastor Jim afterwards so he can answer your questions. But we need to have record of having gone through this training with those who work with our minors. I'm letting y'all out seven minutes early. Y'all just thank Rich. He only preached for like 20 minutes. So. <laughs> Notice we scheduled him today. All right, let's pray. You guys go home and take your nap. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for giving us what we need in Scripture to know how to be good workers, how to be good servants. God, help us to remember it's not about having all the right answers. It's not about always being right. It's not about everybody doing things our way. It's about learning how to follow the leadership that you've given to us in the church to see 
your will and your kingdom grow and go forward. God, help us to pray for those who are in leadership roles uh, above us. Help us to learn how to be good followers. And Father, to anticipate the day that you may call us to be a leader. And at that time, Father, we would step up and be leaders according to the plan that you have designed for us and that you would have for us. God, thank you for these workers, for these servants. Pray that you would bless them, not only in their ministry, but, Father, for the desire to come today and to receive more training, to know better how to fulfill what you've called them to. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can pick up your children uh, up toward the front, I believe. Thank you for staying. You want to pick up tables and chairs? Yes, it does. I think it does. If you have pens, you can place them in this cup. Hard pens, we give them back right here. Huh?